clear up a light in your house, uh, what are we dealing with here? Okay, this is a, a, a really interesting breakdown uh, of what's going on inside an interior light. And I'm going to show you a video in a minute uh, of how I, I rigged up uh, a practical for a shot. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about using practicals. And I'm going to show you what I did to that light to make it look convincing and to have it do some actual bona fide photographic work. Okay, these are the internals of the average uh, house lamp. And in this video, I'm going to talk to you about rigging a, a lamp just like that uh, to actually do photographic work. So here we go. This is about uh, seven minutes. So sit back and enjoy. There's a surprise ending where I'm going to show you, I'm going to re reveal to you uh, my technique. So uh, stay tuned. Okay. Well, let's take stock at where we're at. We've been talking about, um, we're extending our understanding of three-point lighting. And we're doing it now by talking about practicals. In other words, can I achieve the same lighting results in camera with lights you find around the house? And the answer is yes and no. Um, and I'm going to show you why. So a practical is a lamp, let's say, that is featured on camera and we see it and it's on and it's doing work, okay? Um, this is a bedside table lamp and I'm in a room where it might make sense for this kind of fixture to be lighting a character in a, in a film and the quality of it, the softness or hardness, um, the brightness, the color quality, if all of those things uh, seem to agree with the script and the art director and the director and the cinematographer can all agree agree on the applicability of that particular fixture, uh, then we might uh, go ahead and use it. I'm going to show you guys uh, um, a website, uh, the Roger Deakins uh, podcast website, where you'll be able to listen to his most recent um, discussion about using practicals uh, in feature films. And uh, it can be done as long as we are mindful of the criteria that the three-point lighting scheme is um, asking us to consider when we, when we have a lighting setup. So if I choose a lamp, for instance, to be my key light, is it able to provide exposure? Uh, is it going to establish the color quality of my subject or the overall color quality of the shot? Um, is it going to give me uh, shape and texture, tonal control uh, over the image? So am I going to be able to influence the key light uh, the way I might move a conventional around on a stage floor or uh, on a location and get the right shape and angle uh, that I need for the audience reaction that I'm looking for from this particular character. Uh, if I can do these things um, and I can control this fixture in a way that I can control any one of my other conventional units, then I see no harm in using the on-camera fixture uh, as that uh, lighting motivation. Um, the the thing that we have to insist on is control. So we can't walk into a situation and just sort of take what we're given. We have to go into a situation. If we're going to use this lamp, I need to be able to change the bulb if needs be. I need to be able to dim it if needs be. Uh, I need to be able to shape it and control it in ways that are going to maintain an adequate exposure. I'm not going to be overexposed. I'm not going to be too underexposed. Um, I'm, in other words, I'm not going to be at any disadvantage by using this bedside table lamp uh, than if I had used one of my conventionals, okay? So the right tool for the right job. If, if I can do it with this lamp, I will. Um, a lot of times it, it is a savings of time. Uh, sometimes it takes the same amount of time. Now I'm going to um, show you what I did to this lamp in order to make it look good on camera uh, because there were some things that were wrong that, um, that weren't going to allow uh, me to take what I consider to be a good exposure. Um, so I have a monitor. I can look and I can see what my results are. Um, I have a bedside table lamp. I have a, a, a floor lamp across the room that I'm sort of using as a little bit of fill. Um, as the light interval went down in this room, in other words, as the sun outside got darker and darker, um, I had to add some supplemental fill uh, across the room by taking one of my conventionals and just popping it into the ceiling. Um, that's okay. Uh, in earlier takes of this video, uh, when the 
light level in the room was still higher because there was light coming in from the windows. Um, I didn't need that additional supplementary light. But uh, as it turns out, um, multiple takes were necessary. And the sun doesn't stop moving outside just because we're filming. So um, as the sun was going down, uh, the, the overall fill level in the room went down. That's going to be a problem when you're dealing with practicals and you're dealing with the light intervals that are going to be present at 60 watts, let's say. So uh, I ex exposed for the lamp, added some supplementary fill, and then I started looking at the problem of the lamp itself. Now on the monitor, you can see that everything seems to be working the way it should. In other words, uh, I've got a nice amount of light coming out the bottom. I don't have too much overexposure on the wall, although you're going to get some of this scalloping uh, from practical lights. Okay, This is normal, but you can mitigate some of this. In other words, I have controlled how much scallop is coming out of the top of this lamp uh, by adding some things inside the lampshade that I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, I've also supplemented what is coming out of this fixture with uh, a fluorescent tube. And I like to use these little um, uh, oxy-LED tubes. You can get them for 15 bucks at Walmart. Um, but they're nice and small. I'm going to show you in a minute when I take it off the lamp what we're actually looking at. Um, and it's pretty cool because, yes, I see the practical. Yes, it's turned on. There is a bulb inside. It's 60 watts. Um, but it's, it's still not the quality of light that I'm looking for out of a fixture. I need to be able to control that. So I added some stuff. So let me show you what we did to this lamp in order to make it agreeable on camera. The first thing that I did was because the lampshade um, was, was overexposing on camera, I added something called uh, black wrap to the inside of the fixture. Here is... Uh, a roll of cinema foil, okay, this is from Roscoe, there's a, a number of different brands, uh, but cinema foil, okay, and all it is is black anodized foil, and you can bend it and fold it, and you can mold it into whatever shape you want. Uh, I initially tried this round piece uh, to just block the light coming out of the top of the fixture, and that was fine, but the front side of the lampshade was still too bright and there was this this highlight right here was blowing up on my histogram and we can't have that so I added it to the inside and I just made the the whole lampshade darker but the fill is giving it enough exposure to where we don't really think about this lampshade being much brighter than it would be but if I take the foil away you can see just how much brighter that lampshade got and as a result the resulting highlight is also way way too bright for exposure this is what we call clipping and you'll see it on the histogram as a as a predominant peak in that in that um, curve that you're seeing on the histogram and it, it'll be shooting up and probably be cut off by the top of the histogram chart itself that means that this area is so overexposed there's no more detail in that highlight and it's gone digitally it's gone if we were shooting film we might be able to pull some of that back Sometimes if you're shooting in raw profiles on a camera, like a cinema camera, the uh, Arri Alexa or the Blackmagic cinema camera, uh, sometimes there's some detail that's still in that highlight and you can pull it back in DaVinci Resolve. But on my GH5, uh, the dynamic range on this camera is not that great. In other words, the number of gray values from uh, my, 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 uh, my uh, sensor uh, is only about uh, 11 or 12 stops of latitude, which means that this highlight is probably blown out, okay? And there's no way to recover from that. Uh, so what I did was I black wrapped the shade, and then I used one of these Oxy LEDs as a supplementary fixture, and I just dialed up the intensity to what I needed until I got the right amount of value on my face. And then I just used some uh, full CTO gel because this uh, LED tube is balanced for daylight and daylight Kelvin temperature is about anywhere from 5600 to 6000 degrees Kelvin. So I needed to put some orange gel to bring the Kelvin temperature down to match the output of the lamp. So I put full CTO gel on the tube, changed it effectively, changed the output color from daylight uh, 5600 to uh, incandescent balanced at 3200 degrees Kelvin. It matched the output of the lamp and then it supplemented what my key light needed to be from the lamp. You can see right now that I have the basic shape and that's what we're, that's what we're thinking about. 
is the basic shape there? If it is, and it's coming out of this fixture, if I can enhance this fixture in a way that will take that basic shape and just make it brighter so that I can use it with camera uh, and with my cinema lens that has a minimum stop of a T4, then that's all we need. So we just added some additional exposure here until we got enough for a T4 on my lens uh, at 1 50th of a second and ISO 1600. So practicals, if they're on camera and they look real, if I believe what I see, if it looks real, if, if I would expect to see that kind of a light in the shot, if it seems normal to me, if it seems correct, uh, then maybe all I need to do is, is take what I have to work with and just enhance it a little bit, give it a, a little bit of extra oomph somehow. Uh, in this case, supplemental push in my direction to make my half light a little bit more pronounced so that there was a little bit more of a, of a, a fall off, a natural looking fall off. And then I just controlled the highlight to camera with some black wrap. And that's uh, how we work with practicals uh, on a feature film. And you can do it too. So uh, you can shoot in the comfort of your own home with some of your own uh, household devices uh, and appliances. And if you apply a little bit of the three-point uh, lighting uh, philosophy, in other words, key light provides exposure, texture, tone, and color. Fill light controls contrast and an edge light if you feel you need it. Uh, then if it seems appropriate and if it has the right output, go ahead and use it. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that, <clears throat> and uh, your takeaways are obviously uh, black wrap, which is one of the handiest tools uh, available to us uh, on a film set. Uh, my gosh, uh, you can shape, make snoots with it for your lights. You can uh, extend the barn doors on your conventionals with it. You can make barn doors for a light that doesn't ordinarily have it out of black wrap because it's it's fully posable and shapeable and. Uh, you know, you can use it a few times until it gets all gnarly and wrinkled up, and then you toss it away, and and uh, it comes on about a 20, well, what's this? Oh, this is a 12-inch by 10-foot roll for for $10. That's a dollar uh, a linear foot. Uh, that's not terribly expensive for what it is and what it does. Uh, it's an invaluable tool to have uh, in your set bag. Um so you can get this stuff at Adorama. It's also available through filmtools.com uh, in Burbank, California. Uh, either way, uh, I think Adorama has the best price on this small roll, which is the 10-foot roll, 12 inch by 10 foot, uh, $10, a dollar a foot. Uh, you can't beat it. Uh, I keep a number of these rolls around. You can get them as wide as um, 24 inches uh, and as long as 25 feet. Uh, and that's obviously a much more expensive roll of foil, but um, it's sometimes nice to have something that's a little wider than 12 inches. Uh, but you can uh, tape this stuff together with gaff tape, paper tape, uh, and uh, you know you can do so much with it. Uh, and it's one of those uh, simple, inexpensive tools that we rely on heavily, like clothespins, you know, uh, to do our lighting work on pretty expensive movies. So uh, that's a tip for you: black wrap. Um, here's a, a little snippet from the Lee Diffusion uh, website, um, or the Lee Gel website, I should say. Uh, this is the page on Diffusion, and this is all the different densities and colors of Diffusion. You can see uh, the cosmetic series, which introduces a little orange or a little pink to the Diffusion. Uh, if you're doing uh, close-ups, especially on ladies, uh, for things like music videos or makeup commercials, uh, the cosmetic uh, highlights are wonderful gels. Um, the, the, the gel that's featured here is the Lee 216, which is full white diffusion. That's the thickest density of diffusion that we generally use on a film set. Uh, it'll reduce the output of your light by one f-stop, but it'll also propagate that light four times brighter, or I'm sorry, broader uh, in coverage than you would have uh, from the hard fixtures. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, uh, functional um, uh, and practical uh, piece of gel. We use uh, the 216, uh, the 250, and the 250, I don't see 251 here, I think 250, yeah, there it is, 251. Uh, those are full white, half white, and quarter white diffusion, and they are calibrated uh, exactly so that you can recalculate your exposures if need be uh, based on whichever diffusion you've used. 
Uh, if you want to check those out, the website is listed at the bottom of this page. Uh, it's leafilters.com. It, it is gel that's manufactured in the UK. Um, but pretty much every rental house I've ever been to in my 30-year career has stocked Lee Gels as well as Roscoe uh, and a number of other uh, smaller companies um, and aftermarket manufacturers. Gel is something that um, uh, we use uh, as also as an expendable item. You use it a few times uh, and then throw it away. Um, it's one of those things that uh, I don't think we could make movies without gels, especially diffusion gels, because they're so critical in helping us shape and enhance the quality of a light's output, both the conventionals and the practicals that we're using. So even our conventional lights at times uh, need to be adjusted and modified to get just the right results from our tools. So Lee Gels uh, or LeeFilters.com, I highly recommend them. They are a standard in the industry and have been for generations at this point. So in, in, uh, in summing this thing up, uh, when you're working with available light, uh, be able to identify the styles uh, that you're working with and understand the quality of light that's going to come out of them and how to uh, adjust and enhance and control that output to suit your photographic needs. So what is the source of your light? Um, bulbs come in a variety of different um, colors, textures, and qualities. Uh, we have the standard incandescent bulb to the left in 60 watts. We have a compact fluorescent or a CFL, uh, which generally has the least flattering uh, kind of quality of light that comes out of it. Uh, it's not full spectrum, so there will be frequencies of color missing from the lamp's output and that will result in inaccurate color uh, skin tones that you'll find very difficult to correct in post. Uh, so what you want to do is avoid sources that are not full spectrum. So LED household replacement bulbs these days are full spectrum. Uh, initially, uh, when they first started hitting the shelves in your uh, hardware stores, uh, the color quality coming out of them was not that great. It was a lot like CFL output uh, in that there were frequencies missing from the output. But any of the LED bulbs that are out there manufactured these days currently, uh, the color quality is a lot, a lot better. And the LED bulbs don't get hot to the touch. That 60 watt household clear bulb on the left, if you leave that on for 20 minutes and then you try to unscrew it from the lamp and change it out for uh, a different wattage, you're going to burn your hand. The LED bulb all the way to the right, on the other hand, can be burning all day. And if you want to change it out for something else or put some gel over it to change the color of it, you absolutely can do that because that bulb is never going to get too hot to where you can't handle it with your bare hands. So there's some definite advantages to using LED bulbs. That 60 watt bulb, if it's on for 10 hours while you're shooting in a room, is probably going to heat that room up an extra 10 or 15 degrees, whereas the LED will never get hotter uh, than just basically warm and it'll never be too hot where you can't touch it with your bare hand. So understanding what sources you have to work with is critical. If you got compact fluorescents in your shot, you probably want to remove them and replace them with something kinder for your camera, unless that grungy, nasty um, uh, light is uh, what you're going for. And in that case, have at it. Um, Lamps also come in a variety of bases. Uh, the average household bulb uses what's called a medium screw base, um, but there are anything from candelabra featured all the way to the left uh, in E10, uh, 11, and 12, uh, up to the medium screw bases all the way up to EX39. Um, like I said, the standard household screw base is referred to as a medium base, uh, but there are a number of adapters that you can use to modify one base to the other. So if you want to replace a source in a lamp, uh, say you've got a 100 watt bulb and a lamp next to the sofa in your living room and you're shooting a scene, but that lamp is way too bright, uh, 40 watts is generally uh, a really good place to start for a lamp that's on camera, 40 watt household. Um, and that's the bulb feature to the left. Uh, sometimes I'll go as low as 15 watts uh, seen in the picture to the right. Uh, and the problem with a 15 watt bulb is sometimes they have a household medium base on them and sometimes they don't. And if they don't, you got to get a base adapter before you put that 15 watt in the lamp next to the sofa. 
Um, this video right here is about 25 minutes long, so I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I'm just going to show you like the first two or three minutes so you can get a sense of what I'm looking at in this video. I'm comparing nine different bulbs, starting with 15 watt household appliance and working my way all the way up to a photo flood that has been daylight corrected to uh, bluer output um, so you can shoot under daylight conditions with it uh, at 250 watts. And there are implications with the overall brightness of the lamp versus the overall brightness in the room. And I talk about what I have to do exposure wise in order to uh, use different bulbs in this same floor lamp practical in order to get the uh, the uh, lampshade to be properly exposed, the window blinds to be properly exposed, and have the color of the output of the lamp uh, either match or contrast well with the color uh, of the ambience in the room. So I'm going to play the first couple of minutes and then I'll stop it. And if you want to watch the entire video, uh, it is available at the link below here in the bottom of the frame. All right, so let's take a quick look at what's going on with uh, the household practical uh, test and the swap out for different wattages. Okay, we're going to do a neat little experiment here. I'm just going to show you guys, we've been talking about wattages, different wattages in lamps and what they look like on camera. So I've set up a little scenario here. I've got a variety of bulbs um, and I'm going to swap them out one by one and just uh, we're going to take a look at them on camera. So what I've got here is uh, currently a 15 watt appliance bulb and it's the kind of bulb you can put in your refrigerator or the, um, the uh, exhaust hood over your stove. Low wattage, incandescent, so it is dimmable. But the thing about dimming incandescent bulbs is when you do that, they change color temperature and they get warmer and oranger uh, the more you add resistance to the line. So it's not ideal to dim an incandescent bulb. It's better to change the wattage so that you get a nice clean color output as close as you can to 3200 Kelvin. So these bulbs burn at about uh, 2700 degrees Kelvin. Um, so this is a 15 watt appliance bulb in here right now and I'm going to swap it out for next I have a 40 watt incandescent household. Okay, so this is now a 40 watt household bulb. Now, I'm going to uh, draw your attention to the histogram on my um, flip out EDF uh, on my GH5 so that you can see I'm at 800 ISO. I have my uh, color balance set to indoors. That's the little uh, bulb icon with the little rays coming off of it in the lower right corner of the uh, uh, EDF. Um, that indicates um, tungsten uh, balanced. And so that means I'm balanced to the color of the bulb in the lamp, not necessarily the color of light coming through the window, which is bluer because it's daylight and it's about 6,000 degrees Kelvin out there because it's about 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so I want you to see how much brighter the 40 water looks on camera. Now it's probably still tolerable as far as, um, as, far as the way the, um, uh, the bulb looks on camera. Uh, but it is brighter, uh, so it's essentially a stop brighter, one stop brighter um, in terms of relative wattage. So this is a 40 watt incandescent bulb. Okay, so you can see now by comparison, I have a 60 watt uh, LED equivalent replacement bulb in this floor lamp. And if you look at my histogram, you can see that um, I have some values that are approaching clipping, but everything's still kind of intact. Uh, you're going to see a pretty hot highlight in the top of the lampshade at this point uh, developing. And you're going to notice that the blinds outside the windows are, uh, for the window light coming in from outside, uh, those are blowing up pretty good uh, on the histogram. Now, uh, what I can do is start closing down my lens. If I do that, I'm at a 5.6 currently. If I go to a 5.6 and a half, let's say, uh, I can start bringing that lampshade in check. But what it's going to do is it's going to lower the exposure in the overall uh, room. So it's going to affect what other uh, subjects or objects in the frame are going to look like relative to the brightness of that window. So uh, I've gone to a 5.6 and a half at a 60-watt bulb. And next I want to show you 
what happens when I jump to a 100 watt clear incandescent bulb in contrast. Okay, this is now a 100 watt clear uh, incandescent bulb. It's a household style bulb. It just has a clear jacket. It's not frosted. So by comparison, um, I'm, I'm still at a 4 on my Rokinon 24mm lens right now. We were at a 4.5 with the 60 watt LED, which started to bring the value in check on the lampshade. But I'm going to go to a full, five, uh, to a full F, uh, T8 now, I'm sorry. Um, and you'll see how the value starts to come into check. If I go to an eight and a half, uh, we get a little bit better uh, response on the lampshade, and the blinds on the window are starting to come into an acceptable uh, brightness as well. Um, if we looked at my histogram, you'll see that um, I have some. I don't have any values that are really clipping over 110% right now, um, but I do have some stuff that's hovering near the top, dangerously close to clip. So what's happening is uh, the ambience in the room is basically going to start going down because I have to close the f-stop down in order to keep the highlight in check in the lampshade. So this is the result of globing up, we call it, taking a higher wattage. Okay, so <clears throat> That's the essence of the uh, household experiment, um, and the full video, like I said, is available at the uh, uh, the website listed below, and I encourage you to check it out uh, because there are some interesting um, bulb substitutions that I look at on camera, uh, particularly the Sylvania BCA 250-watt blue dyed bulb and the 60-watt blue. Uh, both of those are uh, sources that are closer to daylight. Uh, yet they're in a, a practical lamp, and uh, when you use them, uh, they allow you to make better, uh, take better advantage of uh, window light coming in at a, at a daylight balance of 5600, uh, and not have your lamps and sources inside the room look all orange, unless you like that. If you like the bicolor effect that happens using the tungsten bulbs and the lamps in a room that's lit by daylight, more power to you. That's uh, a look that's actually becoming popular in some uh, corners of the market. And uh, it is definitely a look, um, but uh, that still bothers some cinematographers to have the sources be uh, too orange uh, in a daylight situation. And so for those uh, folks out there that uh, feel the same way, uh, the 60 watt blues and the BCAs are definitely uh, a viable alternative. And they're available at most photo stores that have uh, darkroom equipment. Uh, but moving on, I wanted to show you the... Uh, the uh, photo flood or the 3200 Kelvin uh, photo correct medium screw base bulbs that are available for practical lights. Uh, they're available from most rental houses that cater to feature films and uh, theater productions. Uh, they are manufactured by GE and they have uh, catalog numbers 211 for 75 watt, 212 for 150 watt, and 213 for 250 watt photo flood bulbs with household medium screw base. So if you're uh, setting your camera's color balance to 3200 Kelvin to match other incandescent either conventional sources that you've brought from uh, the truck or from the rental house uh, or other incandescent sources in the house, uh, you can balance uh, your photo floods and your camera and everything to 3200 Kelvin and the sources won't look over warm like some of the lower wattage household bulbs like the 15s, the 40s, and the 100 watt and 60 watt clears, uh, which burn at 2700 degrees Kelvin. So you can raise the color temperature of your practicals slightly to get them to agree more with the uh, uh, tungsten color balance on your camera if you're shooting digitally, or on your film camera if you're shooting um, uh, incandescent uh, balanced film stock. Uh, in terms of control of those household fixtures, there's a couple of ways to dim a household fixture, either with a slider that goes in line with the power cord or with a socket dimmer. And both of these are very convenient ways to control the intensity of the output of an incandescent bulb. Just bear in mind that with incandescent bulbs, if you dim them with resistance dimmers like these are, uh, they will change the color tone of the bulb and they will become progressively oranger. 
uh, and deeper in amber color as you dim them further and further down. So sometimes it's more advantageous to change wattage on bulbs and physically remove one bulb and replace it with a lower wattage bulb than it is to dim the bulb uh, because you will suffer a severe difference in color shift when you dim those sources. On the other hand, uh, some of the newer LED replacement bulbs that are coming out now uh, can be dimmed. They are dimmable, and if they are dimmable, uh, they're more expensive as dimmable models, but if they are dimmable, uh, you can use both of these methods uh, and employ them to change the intensity of the output of an LED replaced bulb source. So these are very handy tools to have in your set bag as well. Uh, this little uh, video is all about adapters. Um, and it's a handy uh, thing to have a look at uh, if you're trying to uh, adapt lamp bases, for instance, or if you're trying to uh, create uh, little socket adapters and things. This is what we call a male Aditap. Uh, I'll play a couple of minutes of this video for you as well so you can get a sense of some of the uh, adapters that are available to you. Everything that I'm going to show you in this video is available through Home Depot or Lowe's, or you can purchase them online in bulk as well. Uh, and they are, again, handy little tchotchkes, we used to call them uh, in the old days. Uh, handy little tchotchkes to have in your set bag for when you're doing some lighting with practicals uh, on a feature film or television show. So let me roll a little uh, footage on this for you. Okay, hi everybody. So we've been talking about uh, using practicals to shoot uh, digital video uh, on location, um, conceivably in your own home. Um, I, um, some of you may have seen um, the video that I put out uh, that discusses um, uh, and compares nine different uh, types of bulbs to put into uh, floor lamps or table lamps um, if you're using those uh, fixtures as your key lights or your fill lights uh, or even your edge lights for that matter. Um, what I haven't discussed with you yet is the broad variety of connectivity or um, sockets that exist for lamps, table lamps, house fixtures. Um, and so you may want to be prepared to have to adapt uh, certain things in order to um, get the right kind of globes in these fixtures, the right wattage, the right color, and so forth. Um, so I wanted to start with a few adapters that I have here. Um, the first and most common adapter that you'll want to know about um, working around the house is going to be the uh, what we call the cube tap, okay? or sometimes folks call these a 301 adapter. Now, I don't call them a 301 adapter because once upon a time there was actually a piece of electrical distribution uh, that came out uh, from, uh, I believe it was um, uh, Paladin or Mole Richardson, and um, they had a 301 adapter that looked nothing like this. So I always call this a cube tap. I think it's because it's, you know, it's in the shape of a cube and you can tap into it three different ways from one single input. Um, whatever you end up calling this, uh, as long as everybody around you understands what you're what you're referring to, that's fine. Uh, I think pretty much everybody in the industry at this point understands this as a cube tap. So you might want to learn that nomenclature. Um, it's great. You run one uh, stinger to a particular spot, and then you have three open holes. Uh, in the days of LEDs, uh, that's a fantastic advantage. Um, when we were still using a lot of quartz instruments and things, um, we couldn't go above uh, 600 watts in any one of those access uh, holes uh, because the total potential for that entire cube tap was only going to be um, uh, 15 amps. So we, we had to make sure that we stayed below a certain watt level uh, so we didn't burn up the cube tap or you know have a, an unfortunate um, incident with fire. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about is um, dimmers, uh, socket dimmers in particular. Um, there are also things like inline dimmers. Here's one that uh, is for a uh, for a neon rig. They also had them for LEDs and, and for incandescent. So you plug it in uh, to your power source and then you plug your, uh, your fixture into um, the dimmer itself and then you have uh, a rheostat um, to adjust the output. And a lot of these uh, dimmers are working on um, just uh, um, square wave um, electronic dimming, uh, pulse width modulation, and uh, once upon a time we had dimmers that worked on resistance, we called them Variax. 
uh, very big, very heavy. Um, so these new uh, forms of electronic dimmers, I think, are going to be more handy uh, moving forward. Um, there are also varieties of socket dimmers. So I showed you a couple uh, on um, the lecture uh, keynote. Um, my favorite one here is the, um, I think this is from Leviton. Um, and this was a pretty compact uh, socket dimmer. So it has a medium household base, just like a, a regular old household light bulb. Um, and you screw it into uh, the light bulb socket, and then you have your dimmer control right here on the front. And uh, you can uh, uh, dim your bulb uh, from 0 to 100% uh, on this little dial right here. And it only adds about an inch and a half to the overall bulb height inside uh, the harp of the lamp fixture itself. So if you have, um, you know, critical depth on a, um, on a lampshade, for instance, it's not going to change the measurement dynamic very much of the fixture that you're using. So these are terrific. Um, uh, they only work on incandescent bulbs or uh, LED bulbs that specify they can be dimmed. Now, some LED household replacements uh, cannot be put on a dimmer. Um, they're te they tend to be the bulbs that are quite a bit cheaper. Um, you'll pay um, substantially more for an LED replacement bulb that can also be dimmed. But uh, if you do have those, uh, those uh, light types of light bulbs, uh, this will work on those. Um, there are things we can do to a light bulb socket uh, or a chandelier socket um, to accommodate different kinds of bulbs. Um, one of the most uh, common uh, that you will run into is the socket to AC power adapter. And you'll notice that this only has two uh, holes for parallel blade. Okay, so uh, this is a non-grounded um, socket, but presumably um, the lamp that you are tying it into is grounded. Um, and if not, then it, then it is technically an ungrounded uh, adapter. Um, but for um, just allowing access for some supplementary power uh, in, a, in a house lamp or something, it's not particularly a risky device. Um, okay, I'll stop the video there. And if you want to uh, see the, in, uh, the video in its entirety, you can visit my website on YouTube and click this link and see the full explanation and you can see all of the socket adapters and things that are available to help you swap and mix and match different kinds of light bulbs for different kinds of practicals. Uh, it's pretty interesting and if, you're, uh, uh, you know, if your career aspirations are t in the set lighting department, uh, it's definitely um, trade craft that you're, you're going to need to know. Um, so I, I recommend the video uh, for those folks. It runs about, uh, I think, 10 minutes overall, 10 or 12 minutes. Um, and it should be uh, a wealth of information for you if you, uh, like I said, do set lighting for uh, a living or if you want to get into set lighting when you graduate uh, and you're interested in uh, knowing what these, uh, these added uh, uh, tools and implements uh, can do for you. Uh, but moving on forward now, so that's basically going to conclude um, the, uh, dis the discussion on uh, use of practicals. I know this has been a, uh, a fairly lengthy uh, lecture. Uh, I, I assume that you'll watch this in, in you know, two or three parts and not all in one sitting. Uh, but if you have, congratulations. Uh, you've you've uh, completed a, uh, a, a worthy task. Um, but uh, I just wanted in parting to uh, remind you folks uh, of the virtual lighting studio uh, that you can access. It's available at zvork.fr, uh, so it's from France. Um, but you have four different avatars that you can select from, and you can conduct your virtual lighting experiments using uh, virtual key, virtual fill, and virtual edge lighting. Uh, you can add up to six lights to a lighting scenario. You can vary their height, uh, their intensity, their hardness, and their color. Uh, and then you have two, three men and one woman to choose from in terms of your, uh, the subject that you will light. Uh, and it's a great tool to practice with, especially if you don't have your own lights at home or if you're, uh, you know, if you're on vacation but you got your laptop with you and you want to do a little tinkering and practice some of your lighting. 
Uh, it's all done with software, and uh, it's a pretty neat tool. Uh, if you want to know how to use it, uh, there are some links at the end of this presentation. Uh, you can find a, a tutorial on the uh, Virtual Lighting Studio on my YouTube website. I also want to show you the website for the Hollywood Camera Work application that we talked about earlier. Uh, there is a, trial, a free trial app available. You can download it to your computer and use it. Like I said, if you don't pay the, uh, the fee for it, the only uh, functionality that you will lose uh, essentially is the ability to save your work to the Shot Designer server, but you can always use your clip it or grab function on your laptop and save your work as PNG or JPEG to your laptop. So it's a great tool if you're making lighting diagrams or if you're doing little tutorials and presentations uh, and it has a number of lighting icons that are fairly industry standard and recognizable by other lighting technicians. So here is my YouTube page. If you're looking for it, uh, uh, look for the, uh, the, uh, the large lighting display. Um, uh, and my name, uh, Michael Walsh. I'm your professor uh, for motion picture cinema lighting and cinematography. Um, my YouTube links are listed below for the, uh, the virtual studio tutorial or for the shot designer tutorial. There's also a number of other lectures and uh, demonstrations uh, and student examples on my website for you to check out and look at so I uh, recommend that at some point in your leisure you look at my website there may be some topics in there that you want to investigate for uh, additional learning uh, opportunities and so forth or to get some questions answered in a pinch uh, and as usual I am available uh, via email or telephone uh, or Zoom if you need a conference call about any of the topics that I've covered in any of my lectures. Uh, if you're interested in a little bit of um, uh, extra credit homework or uh, self-fulfillment, um, there are some downloadable PDFs available uh, through your learning management system that are available to you. There's also a lighting assignment called the Shot Clock that's available to you. Uh, as well as a three-point lighting uh, video demonstration on my YouTube page. Uh, it's a four-part series where I uh, use a variety of different conventional theatrical fixtures and show you how to conduct your three-point lighting technique with a variety of different uh, fixtures in terms of hardness, softness, uh, color quality, um, and um, emitter, uh, fluorescent, incandescent, uh, or LED. So it's an interesting series if you want to check those out as well. Uh, this has been a presentation for Savannah College of Art and Design. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And uh, I hope that uh, we've, we have uh, given you some very functional uh, knowledge that you can practice and take with you into your career out into the field. Uh, and good luck to you. Thanks again for attending and reach out to me if you have any questions. Have a good afternoon.